Okay, we are here today. It is uh, Friday. We are the now. We are at the number three LGO TV big talk, and I started this whole thing because I cannot stand small talk. I think small talk is just the bane of my existence. And the great thing about the world being turned upside down is that there is no more small talk. We only have big talk. So I decided I would create this show to have big talk with my interesting friends. And one of the most interesting friends I have is my man, Jackie Summers, who is here joining us today. And if you have any doubt whatsoever that he's interesting, I already know what's happening below the screen. And by that, I mean, he's wearing a kilt. <laughs> so there is Jackie in his kilt. Jackie is an acclaimed author. He is a seasoned public speaker. He is a serial entrepreneur, and he is the founder of Jack from Brooklyn, Inc. He is also, and I think this is so fascinating, the creator of the award-winning Sora Liquor. So he wasn't just the only black man in America to have a license to make liquor in 2012. He made award-winning liquor. So he's ranked among the world's 100 most influential bar industry figures by Drinks International Magazine. And there's a magazine you should subscribe to uh, in 2019. And he was named the 2019 award winner for the best food essay by the Association of Food Journalists. So that's pretty cool. And then just last week, I don't know if you saw, but he was in Esquire magazine profiled for the great work that he's done in the liquor industry and just being a voice about all things amazing. So Jackie, how are you doing this fine morning? I don't know who you're talking about, but that guy sounds <laughs> cool. I want to hang out with him sometime. I love hanging out with him sometime. And I see that you brought your rum as threatened. Yes. All right. So I want to tell you that I brought my own drink. I'm not a rum girl. I grew up in Miami. I spent a lot of time in the Caribbean, but I'm not a rum girl. I'm a Scotch whiskey girl. So a couple years ago, my husband gave to me on my birthday uh, a single malt scotch that was uh, cast in 1971, the year of my birthday. So I'm going to open it up today with you. So you and I are going to drink a little drink. We're going to have a little conversation. And oh, boy, let's see what happens. The part where I tell you about my mom's favorite uh, scotch joke. Oh, yeah. If you ask her, my mom will say, I don't like whiskey. I just like scotch. And I'll go, Mom, scotch is whiskey. And she'll look at me, she'll go, no, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers to your mom. Cheers. All right. So that is one of the things that I love about you most is that you are, I think, the biggest mama's boy I've ever met in my entire life. You actually go and you take care of your mom. Your mom is, hey, your mom is what, 92? She's 92. 92. And she is tough as nails and she speaks the truth. My mom grew up in a time, I mean, she grew up in the Depression. She grew up in Jim Crow. She was the only one of her sisters that could not pass for white and still managed to be the blackest person I know. But I hang out with her because we have fun. I mean, what she wants to do is to have a good meal, have a good drink talk shit about the family and wonder when they're getting rid of that asshole who's in the White House. <laughs> Don't we all want to do that all the time? I think that's amazing. I love how you always post on social media. Your mom's like, is he still there? And you're like, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And she's like, then pour me some scotch. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Okay. So I am a big believer in nominative determinism, right? Like the names that you're given and the labels that you put on things really determine how you think about who you are, how you define how you define your your yourself in the world. And I tend to give nicknames to people that I adore. Um, They're in my phone as nicknames. I think it goes back to my days in politics where you never actually wanted to have, you know, the president's name. You, know, you don't have the principal's name on your phone because when it pops up, other people see it and then they want to hack your phone. So I tend to give people nicknames. And I know you call me notorious, but you never told me why. I want to know why. Uh, you were introduced to me as LGO. Yeah. And when I heard LGO, I thought B-I-G. And then, and, and then I got to know it and it was like, this person is... enthusiastically bombastic in her intelligence. <laughs> enthusiastically bombastic. I like that. 
it notorious seemed like the right nickname for you. And I don't know if anyone else calls you that, but it, it absolutely fits for me. Nobody else calls no. me that at all. And I don't know, you know, I gave myself LGO because Laura Gassner Odding just seemed like it was too hard for people to say. And it LGO just seemed easier. But I have to tell you, and actually you don't know this, but in my phone, this is what you are. Wait, I, can't I don't know, wait. can you see that? It says the truth. <laughs> That is you. You were in my phone as the truth. Because me... I know whenever I get a message from you, a call from you, a meme from you, and anything from you, it is the truth, whether I want to hear it or not. Like a WWF wrestler. Exactly. I mean, it's like, you know, like Paul Pierce on the, you know, he's one of my favorite Celtics, but, but you are the truth. And so when I do this, what I decided to do is I was like, I'm going to make this interesting and I'm just going to ask everybody for three adjectives that describe them. And I'm going to put that in, you know, the promo stuff. And your adjectives were uh, polymath, autodidact, and the libertarian. That's what I did. But then I went back later and after I did all the promo, I realized that you had, you had um, uh, autodidact, polymath, and then what I thought was griot until I looked it up and realized it was griot. Okay. All right, so there's a new word that I've learned. So autodidact is somebody who's self-taught. Polymath is someone who knows all sorts of you know, languages and information, but talk to us about griot. A griot was an important part of West African culture. This was somebody who carried forth the oral tradition. They were usually an elder in the tribe, and they were the person who told the stories and collected the stories and made sure that there was somebody to pass on their heritage orally. Uh, I consider myself part of a longer story. I consider myself part of something that's gone on for centuries and hopefully will go on long after I'm gone. But it's my job to make sure that the stories are told in a way that not only remembers my ancestors, but carries meaning forth. Stories have so much power. You will remember the meaning of the story long after you've forgotten the protagonists. Uh, so I always want to make sure that I understand that my my story isn't about me. My story is about my place in a larger story. I love that. I So many of the posts that you write talk about how you are merely the messenger of your ancestors that have come before you and the people that will come after. And, and I, I, it is, you, you speak the truth and you give history and you give facts, but you also do it with so much poetry and so much storytelling. But, but you started off, you, so, you didn't start off as Jackie Summers. You started off with a different name and that name gave you trouble. So I just learned the story from you just a couple of weeks ago and I want you to tell the story because I think the question of how do you become the first black man in America to have a license to make liquor starts off with how do you become Jackie Summers? You become Jackie Summers by choosing to, to define yourself. Uh, I am in a weird spot in that I have a particular affliction I don't know what I cannot do. And that has always let me exceed not just what I thought I could do, but what everyone else thought I was capable of. Um, so it's fascinating that you have an affliction that you don't know what you cannot do in a world that has been created, that has a systemic push to tell you every single day what you cannot and should not do. Yeah, how, I, how does I, that happen? I, there's something broken in me where I don't acknowledge those things. Um, when I was three, my mom taught me to read. By the time I was four, I had my own library card and I would walk myself to the library, bring home stacks of books, read them, go back the next day and then drink and read more books. So by the time I entered elementary school in, uh, at five years old, I was reading on a 12th grade level. The, I, I, at first, I thought that I was in the wrong class because kids were learning the ABCs and couldn't read, and I thought there was something wrong. Like, Mom, I think they put me in the wrong class. These these kids can't read. I don't, I don't understand. Uh, but me being that kid it set the tone for the rest of my life in that I'm just kind of waiting for everyone else to catch up. I know what I can do. I, I want the rest of y'all to figure it out. <laughs> So, uh, so it's interesting. You know, it's really funny that you say that because I had I had a similar experience, although it wasn't at a twelfth grade level. My sister is only sixteen months older than I am, and my mom, ever the efficient manager, and I say that as like a huge compliment because I'm, you know, I am her. Uh, she is me. She taught us both to read at the same time, and then when I got to kindergarten, I was like, 
what like what's wrong with all these people? Like, what's going on? And it wasn't until many years after I left my schooling that I, I came to understand that schooling is not designed actually to create thinkers. It's designed to create workers. Um, yes. And I prefer thinking to working. A hundred percent. It's um, our kid. We sent our kids to Montessori school because traditional school created performers, right? People who would memorize information and spit it out on a test, but it didn't create thinkers. And I think there's nothing more dangerous in this world than somebody who can think. Okay. So you learn how to think, you learn how to, 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 to imagine your own future, but you are, you are made fun of on the playground because you have a speech impediment. So your original name is Eric. You're having trouble with that name. So then how do you get from there to Jackie? So just to be clear, I love my name. Uh, the name is Ancient Sumerian. It was one of the original 10 tribes uh, of Assyria, of, of Akkadia, excuse me. Gilgamesh was king. It is a founding city uh, of civilization. Uh, in, the, in the actual, it wouldn't be... I, I don't remember the language right now, but officially it would be pronounced Uruk. However, the, the Latinized version of that would be Arek. I can't pronounce R's and L's. So for me, trying to say Arek or Eric was like trying to say Terar. <laughs> it's just a terrible, awful word. Yes. So I was a smart kid with a terrible lisp that got teased and beat up because of it constantly. But in seventh grade, I made the basketball team and I'm backing up this kid named Mark Jackson, who's a, who's a child phenom. I mean, he was scoring 50 points a game. He was being scouted at 13 years old. Wow. Notre Dame, USC, North Carolina, St. John's, coming to IS-74, my little rinky thing in high school in Bayside, Queens, to watch Mark play. He ends up having this amazing NBA career. I think he's the number one all-time assist leader in the NBA. But because I was his backup, the team knew that no matter how hard I played in practice, I was never going to get to see any real court time. So as a joke, the team called me Little Jackson to make fun of me because I was killing myself in practice and it was pointless. And Lil Jackson somehow became Lil Jack. And then one day this girl named Valerie called me Jackie and it stuck because I could pronounce it. Amazing. Okay, so suddenly you're Jackie. I'm fighting to, to define myself. Okay, so here you are. Now you're Jackie, you're defining yourself. Um, did it stick because the girl was a crush or she was just, how did, why, 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 was, why did that stick? It stuck because it was easier to say than anything with an R or an L in it. That's all. And then, at, at, and then I know Summers comes because you get into graffiti. And I think that's really interesting because, you know, you are a storyteller. You define yourself, you know, as such. And graffiti is storytelling also. So how do you... How do you go from, you know, backing up, <laughs> well, how, do you, how do you go from backing up, like, you know, the guy who's going to become this, like, number one player in the NBA and a mom who, you know, doesn't brook any bullshit to graffiti? Oh, that was very simple. My mom made it very clear she didn't want to hear about anything, so I didn't tell her anything. <laughs> oh, the lies of omission. Okay. Uh, I, the, one, of the, one of the other best decisions I made in my life uh, again, going to public school in, in Bayside, Queens, I spent one year at Cordoza High School, and after three months, it was clear that I was going to die intellectually there. I couldn't take it. Mm. So I made a decision to apply to attend the High School of Art and Design, uh, and that decision changed my life. I was accepted to art and design, studied illustration and advertising, uh, but that was the heyday of graffiti in the 80s. So the great part about that was we were spending six hours a day learning fine art techniques and studying art history, and then going out at night at four o'clock in the morning, going into subway, subway rails with stolen spray paint and using those fine art techniques on subway trains. So we'd studied Degas and we'd studied uh, uh, 
all of the all the old masters, and then use that with use that with spray paint. However, again, Summers was a nickname I picked up because for protection, we we formed crews to keep ourselves safe because graffiti was extremely territorial. Yeah. And one of the crews I rolled with was called the Boys of Summer. So that stuck. So you became Jackie Summers. I love it. It has a certain ring to it. It has a certain ring to it. We have um, we have a mural on our wall uh, that I think you would love. It's by uh, a guy by the name of Percy Fortini Wright, who actually uh, studied fine art and then became a graffiti artist as well. And so the mural is a is a it is a a triptych of um, three cities: uh, Washington D.C., where my husband and I met. Uh, the over the Rhine district in Cincinnati, where my husband's from, and then um, the the garment district in uh, New York City, where my family's from. And it's beautiful, and it's oil, and it's fine art. And then he spray he put it on the wall, and then he spray painted over it. And it's really this combination of the two of them. And it is this incredible storyteller as well. It's you know it's a storyteller piece. Um, so so. Let's turn to then liquor. So you're you are you you are on this path to become an artist, but then you get involved in the bar industry. Or was there like a there's steps a, in between? There's a 25 year gap between. <laughs> okay, so what's the 25 year gap then? Because these are the two parts of your life, and these are the pillars I know about, but I don't know what's in between. Five years on Wall Street. Uh, five years uh, as an advertising. Ten years as an advertising ex executive. 10 years as a publishing executive. So 25 years corporate life before I turned to drinking for a living. Yeah, I would think that for you, 25 years in corporate life would drive you to drinking for a living. <laughs> Was it like organ rejection? Like how did you, did you get into like a suit and tie every day and go to work? How did, did you like it? So the first year I was on Wall Street, I wore a suit and tie every day. And then at the end of my first year, I had my review and my got I got straight fives out of fives and everything. And my manager said to me, you know, you don't meet with issuers or investors every day. You don't really need to wear a suit. And from that point on, I mostly dressed like this. I mean, I didn't have a kilt and I had- I was like, did you wear a kilt in Wall Street? Cause that I'd like to see. <laughs> but it, 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 there was a building of 600 people and not only was I the only black guy, I was the only person not wearing a suit and it confused people. People would come up to me like, what do you, what do you what do you do here? And, oh, you know, I'm an I'm an energy spec in communications, and they didn't understand. It got so confusing that HR had to issue uh, casual casual uh, dress policies because I refused to wear a suit from that point on. When so was there a started, part of so was there a part of you who you know that said like, look, I'm the only black man in this building. I'm the only black man at this firm. If I don't wear a suit, they're gonna think I'm, you know, I don't know, the janitor. Like, is there was it, or did you just say like, was was that was was not wearing a suit almost like that is it is it is it was like a statement, like it was purposeful to do it because I would think that in a way it it, it almost could have been armor to wear the suit in this place where expectations were so different. The statement was suits are uncomfortable. Yeah. That was it. Like, if, if you give me a chance between between a t-shirt and and a suit and tie, I'm wearing the t-shirt every every freaking time. Yeah. And again, that comes back to this whole thing where a I didn't know what I could not do, and b I self definition has been a, a a path of life. The um there was a time uh, about five years into running my my first uh, running my last company where somebody offered to buy it and I had gone to the meeting to talk to this guy to hear the story about how he wanted to buy it and what they were going to offer me and all of that and I we were sitting in you know at a glass table and he like slides the offer across the glass table like as if it's like out of the movies. And I look down, I look to the glass table and I see my legs and my legs are encased in pantyhose. I'd worn pantyhose for this meeting. I hadn't worn pantyhose since I worked in the White House. And I was like, oh my God, I'm wearing pantyhose. And it was that same moment of self-definition where I was like, if he buys this firm, then I have to go work for him at least for a few years of transition. And I have to wear 
pantyhose and pantyhose are uncomfortable and that's not who I want to be, right? It's like, that's not it. What'd you say? They are. They are. Have you worn pantyhose? No, I'm not. I don't, <laughs> I don't wear pantyhose for the same reason you don't wear pantyhose. They're uncomfortable. They're terrible. They're just like the worst thing ever. Okay, so so you, did, you, did you, do you get to the point in your corporate career where you're like, fuck this, I want to do something else? Or was there like, was it, was it a natural transition? How did, how did that work? Me in corporate life was always an awkward fit. Aside from being the only black guy, A, in Wall Street, B, in advertising, and C, in publishing, that whole self-definition thing doesn't really work well when you are a corporate officer. I'll never forget, I was, uh, I was director of new media and, and, and production for a, a, a music magazine, a popular music magazine. And the person, the publisher, who thought he was my boss, uh, his managerial style was emotional terrorism. Mm. Like if he walked in at nine o'clock in the morning and you did not hear bellowing, it meant he wasn't in the office yet. The first issue I produced for them had a Bud Light ad juxtaposed to a pull quote criticizing Bud Light. <laughs> okay. Because editorial did not speak to advertising ever. They both thought what they did was the most important thing. As a production director, I did not care. I did not care what was on the page as long as the page was a perfect representation of what was meant to be there. So one of the first things I did at this music magazine was institute something called a black book meeting, which meant as the only person who could actually sign off on the printing of the magazine, I would have a meeting of the publisher, creative director, art director, advertising director, and managing editor of what the entire book was going to look like. And they all had to approve before I put my signature on it and put my ass on the line. This, generally speaking, went well, except there was one issue that we published which had a feature on a, a punk band where the lead singer was performing buck ass naked, like a big sweaty greasy bear. That's not gonna work in a mosh pit. I'm just saying, that's dangerous. Coincidentally, he bore striking resemblance to this publisher who thought he was my boss. <laughs> so we're in this black book meeting, the executive team flipping through the book to approve its, its, its publication, and we get this spread, and there's this punk guy holding the microphone, Butt ass naked, sweaty as a pig, and the publisher says something to the effect of, Well, he's a sight for sore eyes. And without blinking, I said, Yeah, it must be like looking in a mirror, huh? Oh, that probably didn't go so well. His face went flush, and he said, Who the fuck do you think you are? A punch in your fucking face. Like he's threatening me. He threatened to punch me in my face, and my response was to stick out my chin. <laughs> of course it was. <laughs> You're going to threaten to punch me in front of the executive team? Go ahead. I dare you. So yeah, me in corporate America, that whole self-definition thing, it was never a good fit. I've got dozens of stories where me being me and doing my job really well was still problematic for everybody else. Yeah, I mean, I would imagine that in some parts, doing your job really well was actually threatening to everybody else. I mean, I certainly know as a woman, that's the case. I can't imagine as a black man in corporate America, that's got to be like 15 billion times worse. The amount of times I was put in situations that were designed to fail yeah, and, and succeeded beyond all imagining really upset the people who were trying to set me up to fail. Yes, yes. So then you decide to drink for a living. <laughs> it's such a great term of phrase. I love it. There's a small footnote in there. Yeah. I had a cancer scare. This came while you were in corporate America. When I was working in publishing, my doctor found a, my doctor found a tumor the size of a golf ball inside my spine. He said, you're probably going to die. And now, had you had had you had pain for a long time? Did you know something was wrong? Like, how did you even come to find this this tumor? So, I had had sciatica 
for months so bad that I couldn't sleep. Yeah. And I was up late one night, laying on my back with my feet up against the wall because that didn't hurt. Yeah, every pregnant woman who is listening to this now or in the future is like, uh-huh, yep, I know that position. <laughs> so I get out of bed six o'clock in the morning and I'm laying on the floor with my knees to my chest like a dead bug. Uh-huh. And I laid there for three hours trying to think whether or not I should call in sick to work. And eventually, about 9 a.m., I got up to try to go to the bathroom because I had to pee. And on my first step, my leg gives out. Mm. And as I fall, I hit my head on a bottle of wine that I paused off the night before. So I'm lying on the floor, not on the back of my head, pain shooting down my leg, not able to walk, needing to pee. And my first thought was, holy shit, I can't have sex. Huh. I, I don't even have a girlfriend. I'm no good on my back. I'm no good on my front. I'm no good sitting. I can't stand. I need to get to a doctor and find out what's wrong. <laughs> now we know what really motivates men. <laughs> and when my doctor could not figure out what was wrong, he sent me for an MRI and figured out that 85% of my nerve sheath was blocked. Like, good news, you can still have sex. Bad news, you might die before you get to have sex again. Uh, yeah, that wasn't, uh, that wasn't actually the good news. <laughs> uh, so he tells me, there's a 90, he tells me, we think you have an ependymoma. I make that face because I don't know what an ependymoma is. I said, an ependymoma what? I said, I think that sounds like cancer. And he says it's only cancer 95% of the time. Oh, yeah, okay, great. But I, I, I've never let anyone tell me anything I can't do, so I'm just going to think about the 5%, right? Like, we need to work on your bedside matter. What, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, we can't do a biopsy on it because it's inside your spine. Yeah. But if it's, if, you, if it's inside my spine, you can't do a biopsy on it. How do you get it out? He said, we're going to take a bone out of your spine. Don't do I, what now? <laughs> don't I need the bones in my spine? Isn't that part of how the spine works? We're going to take a bone out of your spine. We're going we're to take your spinal cord out through the hole that we make. And then we're going to do neurosurgery on your spinal cord because that's where this tumor is entangled. So there's a 50% chance of paralysis if you live. But if the tumor is malignant, and it's probably malignant, it's already in your lymphatic system. Oh, this is getting better and better. With maybe six months, you should organize your paperwork. And at that moment, are you thinking, holy fuck, I just spent 25 years in corporate America. I've wasted my life. Or are you like, what's going through your mind? When I thought, I'm going on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And did you? Yes. Where'd you go? Me and 10 friends in Cancun. A nice. House in Cancun and the best food I've ever eaten, and shopping carts full of alcohol, and just the best vacation in my whole life. And I'll never forget waking but weren't up- you, weren't you in pain? Or were yeah. you like, you're just like, screw it. I, I, I'm, I'm in pain, but I'm gonna die, so like, I'm just gonna fight through it? I, I wasn't thinking about the pain, I was thinking about the life. Yeah, yeah, okay. You were finding the joy. So, one morning, before anyone else's hangover had worn off, I decided I want to, uh, I want to have a sunrise walk on the beach because I don't know if I'm going to get to do this ever again. And I grabbed the bottle of mezcal at 6 a.m. And I'm walking down the beach in Mexico talking to death. And death had interesting things to say. She's never wrong, but you really want to listen to her. But the thing I remember, the thing that sticks out of my mind that death said was, Dude, I don't know why this has you so freaked out. It's not the first time I've come for you. This is just the first time you're paying attention. Oh. And and she and as again, she she's right. She was she's always right. I've been shot, I've been stabbed, I've been in a catastrophic car accident. I've almost drowned twice. From what I can tell, this isn't my second go-around. This is at least my fifth go-around. Uh but I had this surgery and they resected this tumor out of my spine. Can I, can I take a second and can I tell you about the, the, the eight hour period of me having this surgery? Jackie, my love, the floor is yours. 
So I get back to New York after this amazing vacation and I'm completely at peace with my mortality. I know that I'm going to die and I'm okay with it. I've never been more relaxed in my entire life. The doctors put you in that robe with your ass hanging out and they give you the shot and they tell you come back from 100 and you go, and I'm dead. Yep. <laughs> and I, when they, when they said that to me, come back from 100, I fully expected to never wake up again. The next thing I know, they're wheeling me down the hallway on a gurney and I'm singing Material Girl, the top of my lungs. <laughs> Here we are. Wow. Ah. Sweet God. Now, I would love to see that in your speaker reel video right there. I'd like to see that footage. <laughs> I get into the recovery room and my nurse asked me, how do you feel? And I go, like a virgin. <laughs> she says, do you know your name. I look at her and I say, I'm Lady Gaga. <laughs> <laughs> Motherfucker. <laughs> you know who you are. I mean, they're trying to see if you've come out from the anesthesia and they can have a real conversation with you. She says, sir, do you know who you are? I say, I realize I'm not Lady Gaga. I'm Madonna. <laughs> <laughs> it's Britney, bitches. <laughs> he asks, do you have any weakness? This is a standard question after you've had spinal surgery. They had okay. my spinal cord outside my body for eight hours. I didn't have any feeling beneath my rib cage. I didn't know if I had feet. I said to her, weaknesses, chocolate, whiskey, and raven-haired women. <laughs> now, was she raven-haired or were you, were you, were you working her? <laughs> and by this time I realized she's cute. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I've got tubes up both my nose and tubes up on both arms. You weren't cute. <laughs> I managed to reach over and put my hand on her knee. <laughs> Playa! And I say, it's important for me that you understand that just because I came out of surgery, Singing material girl and claiming to be Madonna does not mean I do not like girls. <laughs> and you, my dear, I like a lot. At which point she determined I was lucid enough to speak to my surgeon. <laughs> Who told you? My surgeon said one word. He said benign. Hallelujah. Uh, but the interesting thing about all of that is you can't unmake your peace. Like, I still know I'm going to die. That hasn't changed. Death is, death isn't something I fear. Death is a lover who's going to take me eventually. So I get back to my, to my day job again. I'm at a fashion magazine at this point. And I'm thinking to myself, I can't do this anymore. I mean, I, I, the first week that I'm back to work, I get into a four hour argument with the photo director because she thinks the pinks on the cover of the magazine are too pink. Oh. And the grass isn't green enough. And all I could think was, this is what I lived for? Like, this bullshit can't be my life. Yeah. And I walk into to there the next week ready to quit. And before I could open my fat yap, they offered me a package. Huh. Gift of God. I, Manna from heaven. I signed, I didn't even read it, clean up my desk. And after a week of liberation, that was a decade ago, exactly. I thought to myself, what do I really wanna do with my life? And the thing I wanted to do more than anything else in the world was day drink. <laughs> I mean, cheers to that, right? <laughs> I, I, mean, I wanna be around cool ass people in the middle of the day, in the middle of the week talking about shit that matters, having good food and good conversation and good booze, and I wanted to monetize it. I mean, to be fair, you and I became friends because we hung out in bars in the middle of the day talking about deep shit and drinking good drinks. 
but I don't think we monetize that. We'll have to figure out how to monetize this. But this is this is how we became friends. I totally monetize that because I wrote about that bar. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> and you know, and 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 because you're friends with every bartender on the planet, we drank for free. So I guess technically, I probably monetized it too. But the the question again ten years ago was, who's going to uh, who's going to pay me? Who's going to pay me to day drink? Day drink. And what I was the answer? I had the bright idea that I would launch my own liquor brand again with this disability where I don't know of things I cannot do. Yeah. Uh, I had no idea that that was not something that people just do because they feel like doing it. Turns out it's next to impossible. But like, it turns out that next to impossible things are kind of my shtick. It's your middle name. No, but... <laughs> Uh, but I've made a habit of doing next to impossible stuff pretty much all my life. Um, so yes, I took a recipe that I was doing in my kitchen. It's been around for 400 years. No one's, no one has ever made a shelf stable version of this recipe. So this is red drink. This is a form of red drink. This is, uh, called sorrel in the Caribbean. Yeah. It, it is hibiscus flowers boil with added spices and rum. Again, it's been around for centuries. No one's ever made a version that lasts more than a week. I have to tell you, when I was telling my husband that I was gonna have you on the show, you know you you know him, we've all, we've drank together, we've hung out. And I was like, yeah, cause you know, I wanna talk to him about, about creating sorrel. And he was like, wait, Jackie created sorrel? Like <laughs> he, 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 he didn't know, like he knew about the drink and he knew about you, but he had never connected the two. So yeah, I mean, every Caribbean family has a recipe for this stuff and every Caribbean family thinks their version is the best version ever. Of course. So I start off, I start off to try to figure out how to, how to do this thing that cannot be done. And it turns out, again, not being a food scientist, that it's really fucking hard to make a shelf stable version of a beverage that's been on for centuries. After about, 600 fails, I come up with a version that can't be broken. You can open it, close it, put it in the back of your car, freeze it, boil it, shelf stable, did so, it. So now in these 600 tries, were you tasting it all? Was your mom your taste tester? Like how did you, how would, did, what happens here? I would wake up in the morning, make a batch of this stuff uh, and then see whether or not it was breakable and the first 600 so versions just broke down immediately. It, I mean, the, the joke I tell at this point is, if you think you have an idea that's so good that no one's ever thought of it before, it's probably a terrible idea. There's probably a reason <laughs> no one has ever done this. Because <laughs> someone else has done the 600 tries. What? But you had this idea and no one else had done it before and it took you 600 tries and then you get and, there. And again, I don't know what I can't do. Right. Uh, it's a great, that's a great disability to have this like blind enthusiasm. You know, it's like ignorance is bliss. It's I, like, I, it's fantastic. I don't know if it's enthusiasm as much as it is a whole lot of ancestral stubborn. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, I come from a long line of Jewish women. So I, you know, I, I see you. I see you here. <laughs> Hi, baby. Um, so it turns out that making the shelf stable version was the easy part. Getting a license to make liquor is nigh impossible. Hmm. Uh, and just to be clear, it's it's that way by design. For everyone. It's not hard if you have either the money or connections in liquor. I had neither. Okay. Uh, it is a 10 year check, federal, state, city, on everywhere you've lived, everywhere you've worked, every dime you've made. If you have any criminal convictions, it's an automatic disqualification. You have to put the lease of your, you have to put the address of the lease you're holding on your application, meaning they expect you to be holding physical space mm -hmm. application process, which can take up to two years. All right, so you have to be a landowner. You have to not be uh, profiled by police to be arrested for some bullshit charge. Like, there's a whole lot of 
systemic shit that's wrapped up in lack of access and lack of ability to break through this wall. You have to put the serial numbers of the equipment that you intend to use on your- So you have to have full capital and equipment and, uh, and access to resources that people give you believing in you because you look like everyone else who's been successful in the past, which you didn't. Did not have. Right. Uh, but again, weirdly broken. It did <laughs> somehow that did not get in the way, and I was actually able to get a liquor license in February of 2012. And I didn't know it at the time, but I was the only black person in America at, at that time with license to make liquor. Incredible! Incredible. So when did you when did you find that out? Actually, when did you find that fact out? I found out as I started to go around early, later that year to ply my wares, because it turns out that nobody had ever seen a black liquor brand owner before. So I was going into bars and restaurants and retail stores and going, hey, here's my product. And they were being told, oh, deliveries are around the back. No, you yeah. don't understand. I, I own this product. I make this. Wait, we don't understand. What, what do you mean? I'll say it slowly. I own this. <laughs> I own this. Yeah, ownership, huge. The joke I tell at this point is, it was more likely that the people I was encountering, again, restaurants, bars, nothing special, had been in the physical presence of a lion, a tiger, or a bear but had never seen a black liquor brand owner in person. So was there a person behind the bar or somebody who was like, you're the first black liquor owner you've ever seen? Was there like a moment when you were like, I started, oh, really? I started to ask around. It turns out, I mean, there were a handful of people, but there were a handful of black people at the time who were doing things similar. There were a, a few prominent black bartenders. There were a few, people who had either import licenses or contract bottling situations. But when I started to ask around what the story was, it turned out I was the only one. I was Tigger. <laughs> one of these things is not like the other. So there you are. So you you have this license, you're you're applying your wares, you're realizing that you're the only one. And I don't I I I don't remember because I've drank a lot of alcohol and probably more because I smoked a lot of weed because you and I were both in high school in the 80s. So, you know, we remember those times um, or really maybe not so much. But um, so when did like the speakeasy cocktail craft cocktail world start to generate? Wait, are you pouring a second? You're pouring a second or are you on your third? Fifth. Fifth. Oh my God. Well, I got to catch up here. I'm going to catch up. No, 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 no. Please do not try to keep up with me. Please. This is ugly because, you know, I worked out for an hour this morning and then I had a, then I had a, a, a 200 calorie uh, protein bar. So, you know, we'll see how this goes, but no, I'm, I'm not going to keep up. I can't, I can't keep up, but I will, I will have a second here at our 10 30 AM uh, while you have your fifth. I'm a professional. Please don't try to keep up. <laughs> don't do this at home. So at what point does the craft, co the craft cocktail sort of speakeasy bar world start entering into the, the, you know, the bar scene? Is it, is it in 2012? Is it after, is it before? I just can't remember. It started really around 2008 with a guy named Bill DeGroff. Okay. Who's affectionately known as King Cocktail. Okay. Is at the Rainbow Room, revitalizing cocktail culture by himself. Ah. He takes on two apprentices, Audrey Sanders and Julie Reiner. Uh, and they go off and they successively launch some of the best cocktail bars still on the planet. So are those like Death & Co? Or like what are those? What oh, are the... This is the early stuff. This is like Pegu Club. Oh, I love Pegu Club. Right, yes. that's Audrey. She yeah, worked okay. Uh, Clover Club, who's who, that's uh, Julie Spot. Uh, they basically start the cocktail revolution as we know it. They're my patron saints. I just want to go on record by saying I love them. And and I want to go on record as saying women don't get enough credit for having started the cocktail revolution. Hell to the yeah! Thank you very much, Audrey and Julie. Like. 
they're the godmothers of all of this, all of it. I love it. And thank you for saying that because I think you and I, the first time we met, I think you, I may be wrong, but I think you clocked me as being like legit when I was like, oh, my favorite drink is the penicillin. My favorite bartender is Ezra Star a drink. And you were like, okay, yeah, these are real drinks. These are, this is a, that's a real person. And, you know, and, and, and I think we drank in New York with Pam, um, uh, Pam Wiz. What, what's her last name? Wiz. Wiz. It is Pam Wiz. And she's best friends with Ezra. And it was like the women, the women who can hack it behind a bar, they are, you know, you want to talk about badass, man. Really? Talk about bombastic. They are just, they are tough as nails and creative and brilliant and just charming and incredible. So, okay. So these two women are, 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 you know, they're, they're, they are sort of his mentees and they just sort of help shape the, the craft culture world in the, in the late 2000 aughts. Right. Uh, and what I what I what I believed about myself again, not knowing what I cannot do, I thought my beverage was pretty good. It turned out that it was absolutely fucking fantastic. Yeah, hell yeah. So I enter Sorel in international competition, and it gets unbelievable ratings. Sure, it, of course. It gets Natural. Casual. Stars in the hardest competition in in the country. It ranks 95 out of 100 points in an in international competition. Wow. The New York Times calls it Christmas in a bottle. Love it. Star Magazine puts it on the celebrity page. It was, in, it was literally in getting press every single week to the point where people were asking me who my marketing team was. And you're like, um, me. <laughs> Money from so it turns out that for all of the Caribbeans who think they make the best version of this, I actually do make the best version of this on the planet. This is like the time when I try to tell you I make good mac and cheese and you're like, sit down. <laughs> you're wrong. No, no. I don't care what you put in it. No, no. I don't care how many, you know, Latinx or black women are told you it's good mac and cheese. Sit down. Yeah, sit down. Yeah. So you're like uh, 95, motherfucker. It's it's a conversation it's a conversation I have with my sister on a regular basis. My sister thinks her mac and cheese is really good, and she said, "Let's have her mac and cheese off. You bake yours, I'll bake mine. My husband will be the judge." And I said to her, "That's dangerous. That's divorce terms." I'm not gonna be responsible for your divorce. <laughs> That's bad. I would never. I would never enter that conversation. I would never no, do that. No. <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, Sorel goes from me hand delivering bottles to local restaurants and shops in a few years to being distributed in 22 states and four countries. Amazing. So then what happens? Then you start getting offers. Oh, you know, there's only two workable models for a craft distiller. There's either you have the wine model where you are having, you have a visitor center and you are having people come into your place and pay for tastings and that's subsidizing your your actual sales or the big boys come for you with a check the big boys came for me with a check did they know you were black at the time i kind of think it was hard to hide <laughs> <laughs> to give you an example while they were whining and dining me one of the places that we went was Tavern on the Green. Mm -hmm. and so there's this table booked at Tavern on the Green, and I'm meeting with these executives who were trying to convince me to sign a, a multi-million dollar national deal. And in the middle of it, the maitre d' comes over and he goes, excuse me, are you Jackie Summers? Oh, okay. Like, that's me. And then he spends the next five minutes gushing just gushing about how much he loves my product in oh. front of these people who were trying to get me to sign this contract. Were you like, I swear I didn't put him up to this? <laughs> I didn't pick the venue. I couldn't have put him up to it. Okay, here's my question though. Tavern on the Green, doesn't it have a dress code? Did you have to wear a suit? Were you wearing a jacket? <laughs> were you wearing a kilt? What was going on? It's summertime. Okay. You can sit outdoors. Okay, okay, so it's more casual. All right, I, I was trying to like wrap my head around the visual image of you sitting there and I couldn't like, my brain was breaking between the idea of the suit and the kilt and I just got to figure it out. 
I do. Oh, I think you froze. I think you froze for a minute. Maybe you'll come back. I hope you'll come back. Um, so uh, if you want to learn more about Jackie Summers, make sure you go check him out. You can see right here below Jackie Summers dot NYC is where you can see him. And he has a ton of amazing writing and stories. And if you want to learn about how all sorts of parts of history are impacting who we are today and what our current culture is, that is a great place to go. He's got, um, he's posting everything on Medium. He's also got a Patreon account that I hope that you will, um, pay uh, to be part of because it he absolutely does yeoman's work in order to sort of keep us all educated about where we should be going and what what uh, we should be thinking about today. Um, he is, oh, he's, he's dropped off. So I'm hoping that he will be back soon. I'm going to quickly text him while he, while, while I've got him, but I'm sure that he will come back. I'm going to text him here at the truth um, and tell him to come back because he is, again, he is the truth. He's telling me he's got connection issues. So I think this is a fascinating thing. And if you have questions for him, if there's anything that you want to know, please put them in the comments right now, because I'd love to ask them. I know that you're here because you find him just as fascinating as I do. So put those questions in the comments and I'll make sure that we get to them. We're going to spend another, um, you know, seven or eight minutes with him, but let's make sure that we get some of those questions answered. So here he is. He is back. I'm adding him. Here you go. So um, you're back. You're back. I was just telling everybody where to find you and how incredible you are and how they should uh, patronize your Patreon account and put questions in the comments. But okay, so there you are. You're sitting at Tavern on the Green. The maitre d' comes over and is going on for five minutes about how amazing you are. So and the, then what happens? The short version of the story is I sign a multi-million a multi little country to take my, my brand national and they renege on that signed contract. But they came after you. Yeah. So why'd they renege? I couldn't tell you what their motives were. That's not for me to say. What I can say is the person who was the money behind the deal is the grandchild of one of the biggest food fortunes in the country. Hmm. And somebody like me, I mean, if we all agreed, we all agreed that it was a nine figure exit. Am I, are you still here? Did, are you lost? I think we lost uh, LGO. I'm going to text her to see what's going on. I don't know. Yeah. So I heard he was the grandson, biggest uh, food fortune. Okay. And then I lost it. So yeah, everyone figured out that, that if we did this thing, it was easily going to be a nine figure exit in, in under a decade. Yeah. They, they wanted the brand. They didn't want me. Ah. Six months after that deal fell through, I negotiated a second contract to completion with one of the biggest liquor companies on the planet who also reneged. Was it the same issue? Was it that they didn't want you? Was it the was it that they didn't see a market for it? What happened? No, again, they all saw the market. They all loved the product. At the end, what I was told was, "quote We're not comfortable." That's what I was officially told. My mentor still does work for them, and asked. He actually went to somebody and asked, "What the hell happened? You were in a bidding war. You made this aggressive bid. You wine and dine him. What went wrong?" They came after you. And they said to my mentor, we were afraid we weren't going to be able to control him. Oh, well, because he's somebody who has spent his career knowing, not knowing what he can't do. So he just does. But, but I mean, that's where we have contracts. Yeah. Right? So, you, so legally, it wasn't a question. It was a question of what happens, what happens when I break through this entrenched barrier? Then what? Then, then what becomes possible? So, what do you do with that? You're like, okay, they thought I couldn't. Con they thought they couldn't control me. Read into all sorts of racism and all sorts of issues there, right? I mean, that's like, it's like, 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 like you know, skywriting, you know, in giant like forty foot letters there. I mean, <laughs> like, it's just ridiculous. And 
so what do you do? Do you keep building it yourself thinking I'm going to sell it eventually, or maybe I'll just, I'll just run it forever just myself because things are going fine. Or is it an untenable thing to run? I, I just don't know the business of liquor. Like, do you have to be able to grow it enough? Is there like a critical mass moment where you can keep it going on your own? What I did was have a nervous breakdown. Okay. Well, that's an option. I, it wasn't an option. It wasn't something it just happened. I chose. Yeah. Uh, I ended up homeless for a year and a half. Uh, and the combination of a nervous breakdown and being homeless will actually really give you time to think about things. Yeah, you and I have talked about this a lot because we've talked about how you're building your speeches. You know, you are, are very high in demand public speaker, you know, before the days of COVID, we'll have the days after COVID again, but you get called to come and speak to both inside the liquor industry and outside the liquor industry about just entrepreneurship and how do you break through barriers? And there's some, you know, some diversity and inclusion and, and, and equity stuff, but I, I, yes, that's important, but I don't want it to be like, here's a black man. He could talk about DEI, right? Like there's so much more that you, that, that you're hired to talk about. And we talked about how your original speech was sort of following the chronology of your life. And I was like, you should start with, so there I was waking up in a dumpster as the so like cold open. So this, you woke up at a dumpster. You had time to think. December 17th, 2016, I'll never forget uh, waking up to snowflakes melting on my face, which sounds serene. It sounds beautiful. It's poetic. It's lovely. I want that. Until I realized the reason that there were snowflakes on my face was because I was sleeping in outside in a pile of garbage. I don't want that. Yeah, that, that will... Uh, that will that that can be a wake up call. Suddenly, we're not in a haiku anymore, but we're like in a horror movie. So this is the point where I invoke the Phoenix myth. Ah, uh, everyone is familiar with this idea of a bird that dies in flame and is reborn in flame. What most people never think about is why would you choose to be reborn in the manner in which you die? Like if you knew you, you could be resurrected, but you'd been shot, and you knew in order to come back, you had to be shot again, would you choose that manner of rebirth? Okay, this is really deep because when we think about the phoenix, the phoenix is rising from the ashes where it was burned. And I've never thought that you don't want to re-rise in the same fucking flame. People think a phoenix is fireproof. It literally burned to death. Yeah, it's not fireproof. That's kind of the whole point. It's not fireproof. And the act of rebirth isn't autonomic. There's a choice that happens. So at some point, this conscious, disembodied pile of ash and soot is actually thinking, do, like, why would I come back to that? And do I really want to burn alive? Because burning sucks. Yeah. Uh, and a phoenix, as we know, reborn in flame. But Jesus Christ, why would you choose to do that? Yeah, I don't think that sounds so pleasant. No, no. However, uh, good reasons were in my life to, to be reborn. And so you choose. And like... It, it's easy to say, you know, I won this award for best food essay in 2019. What's not, easy, what's, not easy, what's not as easy to say is I wrote that essay on my iPhone while I was homeless. That's incredible. It's incredible. I think some of the most powerful writing I do is when I wake up in the morning and I like thumb it out on my iPhone. But I'm doing that from the luxury of my fancy ass bed in my fancy ass house. And the, the, the taking away of the governor that's telling me, don't write this, don't write this, edit this, write it this way, use that word. I, I think that I write my best when I'm super raw. I can't even imagine how raw it must be to wake up and realize that you're in a fucking dumpster, right? Like this is where you are in your life. And especially on the 
on the back end of having this potential like seven figure checks entering your bank account, right? So you're like, it's just like the extremes of that experience. It can't, it can't, but push so much knowledge and perspective and wisdom through you. I, I'd imagine as somebody who is a storyteller, is a griot, right? Like how do you, like it, it, it can't but not come out of you and it must pour out of you in such a way that you can't not tell those stories. Did you see the play Hamilton? Of course. I wrote my way out. Yeah, yeah. I wrote my way out. Yeah. So you're writing right now. We're getting to the end and we're already <laughs> over the hour, but I want to, I, I, I could talk to you all the damn day, although it's 11 a.m. and I'm drunk, so I couldn't talk to you all the damn day. Give me one sec. I need to plug in my computer. Okay. Hold on. So, oh, there's the kilt again. So we <laughs> see the kilt again. So what I want to do when Jackie comes back is I just want him to quickly tell us, um, a little bit about what he's doing now. So he's working on illustrated fairy tales, which I know you're like, what? Wait, what? Illustrated? Like he's going from 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 fine art to graffiti to the corporate life to um, making liquor to now and and you know unbelievable essays and writing and now illustrated fairy tales. So we just have a couple minutes left. We're already over, but I I just I just tell us about these illustrated fairy tales because I have been able to read some of the writing of it and it's just fucking unbelievable. Talk so to I, us about this. I'm a big believer in fairy tales. It, they're the first things I read. They're the first things we all read. Uh, they form a permanent part of our international vernacular. There's a reason people still know who Aesop is 4,000 years after his death. So I started to write fairy tales in the modern vernacular, meaning that there's cursing and sex and death and fun stuff. Yeah, I've read a little bit of your writing and there is a lot of F-bombs. Fuck yeah, there are. <laughs> and you know, my friend, that I love a little F-bomb. So the Garden of Infinite Bucks, yeah, I wanna live there. Like there is, there's a lot of good stuff there. But I, I think, Again, I, I, there, there isn't anyone actually doing this right now. There are no yeah. illustrated fairy tales for adults. Dr. Yes. Seuss did his thing, but those are definitely written for kids. There was a book a couple of years ago called Go the Fuck to Sleep, which is which was for parents, but not really a fairy tale. Yeah, it was like a gimmick. I want to write stories that have real meaning where people will actually really personally associate with the the lesson behind the words. My first book is being shopped right now to publishers. It's called The Garden of Infinite Fucks. And, and it, I know it's getting a ton of excitement from the publishers. It is about how to cope with uh, social justice fatigue. And it is 30 years of me studying Taoism condensed into a few hundred words and a lot of cursing. Yeah, yeah. I I love the Garden of Infinite Fucks. You you sent me the original manuscript for it. You asked me if I'd write the forward, and I think my response was, "Hell yeah, I'd be honored to." But also, I think you should get a bigger name because this is so important, and people need to read it, and it needs to have huge marketing potential behind it. And you were like, "Notorious, shut the fuck up." So, so <laughs> you know, whatever. I'm in. If you need it, I'm in. But it is it is. I think. I think, you know, a lot of the writing that I've read of yours lately is like, yeah, there's going to be a ton of fatigue right now, but like, and it hasn't just been like, oh, and boo hoo, because we've been dealing it for 400 fucking years. It's been like, yeah, because it's hard and anything that's important is going to be hard and that's okay. We'll get there. Like we're going to get there. And I just, I, I really... I deeply appreciate your voice right now. This is why you are the truth in my phone, right? I deeply appreciate your voice and I deeply appreciate what you are bringing to the conversation because it is both long form and deep and important and also short and pithy and poignant. And I just, I, I am, I, the world needs your voice. The world needs your words. And I'm really glad that you are out there bringing them to us every day. And I'm glad that you were here bringing them to us today. So because we always have, I'm going to end with a preview of a fairy tale I'm working on right now. Oh, yes. Awesome. Which, which I will tell you 
and and no one else has heard this. This is an exclusive. Because you have me saved <laughs> as the truth in your phone. Mm -hmm. I'm working on a fairy tale called Truth Scars Her Face. Oh. Truth and lies are sisters. They're identical twins. Lies spends all day making herself look beautiful. Her hair is done, her nails are done, her lips are done, her skin is flawless, she's physically perfect. Truth spends all day making herself less attractive. And when she gets as physically unattractive as she can be, she begins to scar her face. And her servants come to her and they plead and they beg, why are you doing this to yourself? You are so beautiful. Why would you do this to you? And Truth says, do you see my sister? Everybody will believe a beautiful lie. Nobody believes truth until it's too ugly to deny. Truth scars her face. Oh my God, I'm... <laughs> Well, I'm crying. <laughs> that is incredible. That is incredible. Fairy tales for adults. Fairy tales, yay. Um, that's incredibly powerful because the truth is sometimes, the truth is sometimes ugly and sometimes that's okay. There were people who didn't vacate Pompeii until they saw the lava pouring down the side of the mountain. There are people who right now don't believe you should wear a mask. There are people who right now don't think that climate change is a real thing. No one, be everyone believes a beautiful lie. Nobody believes truth until it is just too ugly to just, oh, oh, wh what you mean? We're having 50,000 new COVID cases diagnosed every single day in the United States. Maybe this is a real thing. We've got 128,000 dead. How much uglier does the truth need to be before we start to believe it? It needs to be ugly and it needs to personally affect us. Truth hmm. scars the face. Truth scars the face. Well, Jackie, I could talk to you all day long. I don't know that my liver would handle it, but... I love you, man. You are one of my dearest friends. I thank you for being willing to be part of this magical mystery tour that I'm calling LGO TV Big Talk. I don't know how I'm going to do on my noon conference call, but well, fuck it. Have a glass of water. You'll be fine. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have a glass of water and like a loaf of bread, <laughs> maybe some bacon, right? Like fat. Fat is good for, for alcohol. Have an avocado. You'll be fine. Oh, there we go. Good fat. It's good. Thank you so much. If people want to find you, uh, they're going to find you at JackieSummers.nyc. How else should they get in touch? Uh, it's Jack from BKLN on Facebook or Twitter and The Liquidarian on Instagram. So follow Jackie. Um, read his words. Absorb his words. Enjoy his words. Thank you, Jackie. Notorious, and always a pleasure. Thank you. Love you a lot. Love you too.